This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting this podcast and helping me get out of debt. When I put out the call for the BBS documentary around 2001, several hundred people responded, and among them were some really interesting stories, and, and I had to track some of them down and make sure they were what they said, and, and I only had a few people who gave me stories that were a little bit too fantastic for the real. But there were also people whose stories were much more fantastic than they were letting on. Two of those people were Frank Segler and Bootleg. Frank Segler was out in California and had been an Apple II cracker. It won't be a surprise to hear that it was pretty difficult to get people to admit that they were Apple II crackers back in the day. Something about admitting to being a software pirate somewhere in your past it just made people think, better to leave that all alone. Only a handful of people came forward. One major group was the Midwest Pirates Guild in the 612 Minneapolis area, and it was a delight to interview them. The other one was The Freeze. The Freeze's real name is Frank Segler. He's quite fine with people knowing that. He was quite proud of the work he had done, and interviewing him was one of the strangest experiences of the entire production. So when you go out to interview people, you usually have a narrative in your head, some idea of what kind of story you're going to tell, and, and then things will get shifted here or there, but you expect the bones to probably work out. Naturally, if things go in a different direction, you follow it, but you like to think that if you did your research right, it didn't really change much from what you expected. It was my contention that Apple II Pirates did it for fun. They cracked games because they could. They would get their hands on them, crack, and then distribute them because it was a glory. It was a moment of shining out your talent to the world. It wasn't going to be something to make you rich, and it certainly wasn't because you hated software producers. It was just a fun game. Frank had made it quite clear in our conversations before I flew to where he was that, in fact, it was a money-making scheme for him because his family was so poor that he needed the money. He would crack for pizza. He would crack for a few extra dollars. The kids around the neighborhood would bring software to Frank. He'd figure it out, and then he'd crack it for food. So I already knew that Frank's interview was going to be somewhat disruptive to my script. At the time that I interviewed him, Frank was semi-retired as one of the largest value-added resellers in the United States. Uh, a value-added reseller is somebody who gets their hands on lots of parts, sometimes through the gray market, uh, sometimes by going through other inventories or being given extras, and then repackages it for sale. Maybe they get 100 or 200,000 of a part, they split it apart into sets of 100 and they sell 100 packs. Or maybe they get a shipment of modems and it's not sure if the modems work or not, so they test them, repackage them, and then sell them at a much cheaper price. It's a, it's a business that really takes advantage of a global market. And at the time that Frank and his brother had started this business, which had a dozen different names over the years, the world was ready for paying a little bit less than retail price for computer equipment. As Frank explained it to me, his brother had traveled out to the East and gotten married and settled down and, and had kind of gotten himself hooked up with the electronics sellers and resellers and warehouses of the area and figured out that if the two brothers put their heads together, they could figure out what to ship and resell in the United States for prices that would easily undercut anything you found in the magazines. So the brothers started on that business, and it took off. 
Frank walked me around his warehouse. It was a really impressive operation when I was there. There were large areas that were piles of parts, and there were sets of conveyor belts for whatever was being worked on. He explained to me that there were tractor trailers that would park up overnight, and then they would fill them by the end of the day, and out they would go for sale. They were making money. And Frank and his brother had become significantly rich. I never really knew what Frank's total worth was, but there were indications I got over the time that I knew him that told me it was quite a bit of money. Getting back to the Apple II cracking, Frank was called the Freeze. He knew a bunch of other people in the Apple II cracking scene, and the things that he learned and the techniques that he perfected, they were solid engineering. He created an alternate boot ROM to allow him to hack various Apple II programs and, and get access to the memory while a program was running to make it easier to break down. Uh, there were a number of traps and tricks in some of the larger, more popular titles, and Frank the Freeze had easily cracked them. When I put together a bunch of Apple II crack screens, it was very important to me that I transcribe all of the names of all the crackers and put them up on textfiles.com. And for the years hence after I did that, it made it so that Apple II crackers did searches for their name, found it on this pantheon of Apple II crack screens, and would go out of their way to contact me. It's how I met a number of famous Apple II crackers. They just had gone Googling for their name, and there it was. Frank was not just unashamed about his Apple II cracking. Frank was proud of it. He was proud of the things that he had learned. He was proud that he was able to provide money for his family and for himself when he needed it. He was proud of the fact that when his back was against the wall, he was able to find a way out of it. And here it was years later and somebody was doing some sort of a movie. Well, he wanted to be in there. I visited Frank a couple times, once at his work where he gave me that tour and where we conducted the main interview that's in the movie and then once at his house. And it wasn't until I visited his house the second time that I really came to understand how much money Frank had. I, I can barely describe adequately how luxurious this mansion was. It had a foyer worthy of an Italian restaurant. It had a living room that you could hold a seminar in. It, it, had, it had a real sense of the best of everything, you know, the best of the best kind of kitchen to cook in, the best kind of lounge to stay in, and, and the most beautiful office that you could get work in. And so at some point, Frank asked me how things were going on the money side, and I told him it was a little bit of stress that this movie was being made, but that I really believed in the subject. And, and he said to me, you know, I believe that you believe in your subject as well. And he told me he'd mail me a check towards helping the movie along. So at some point, I was home, and I got a check for $10,000. Frank had just given this money to me in a way to say, I think you're going to really make something special here, and I don't want you to think as hard about certain things. And it really made a difference. It wasn't a case of the documentary not being made or, or being made, but that money sat and made it easier to choose to go to more obscure areas and interview people who were historically important but not located near anybody else. It certainly made it easier for me to travel out to see Jack Rickard, who was an important and seminal figure but wasn't anywhere near anyone else. And, and there were all sorts of other cases where I would never have thought of doing it if I couldn't tap a little bit into Frank's gift. And, you know, when we had been discussing things in that beautiful office, in that beautiful home, Frank gave me a book that he thought I would like. And it was a nice enough book 
that indicated that extraterrestrials had been enough of a presence in medieval times to have made it into paintings and so forth. So it was a book a little bit on the fringe. I didn't really look at it all that hard. It had a nice cover and it had some nice writings and pictures and diagrams inside explaining that this mark in this painting was a UFO and, and what could be inferred from that. But it wasn't until later that I happened to read the introduction. And at one point, the person thanked Frank by name. And I realized I wasn't the only person who had been a beneficiary of Frank's generosity and his support of an obscure project, a UFO fringe conspiracy book, a documentary about dial-up bulletin board systems. He had taken his money and he had made the world a little bit better. So, like I said, Frank had a beautiful home, but one of the things I found out from him while I was there was that this wasn't the home. This beautiful mansion he was in was one that they had purchased temporarily while the real house was being built down the street. It was being built from the ground up, and it was costing $10 million to build. This was going to be a house beyond belief. He later told me that the pool had won some sort of architectural award and he lived in absolute luxury in this home. But there is a twist. One of the things Frank told me when I interviewed him was that he had come down some time ago with a medical problem. And in this medical problem, he had developed small but growing tumors in his brain. They were starting to affect his memory. They were starting to affect his personality, and he knew, even with all the best doctors in the world, literally the best doctors in the world, taking care of him, he was only staving off the inevitable. He was not going to be able to get cured. So one side effect of this was the way that it was affecting his body meant that over time, he couldn't even leave this beautiful house he was in. He had to be in an area that was temperature controlled and allowed him to move around even though he couldn't predict which limbs would work that day. And he just had to take every day at a time. Frank made his way out to one of the premieres of the BBS documentary, and I was falling over myself, thanking him for everything he'd done for me and for his part in the movie. And, and even then I could see he was not exactly the same as when I last met him. But I shook his hand and, and I thanked him for everything he'd been a part of. And over the years, I would write him. And occasionally he would write back, and occasionally he would not. And for the past few years, he has not. So among the things that Frank told me in between the stories of cracking and the glory and the wonder of Apple II piracy, he made it clear to me that there was a person I needed to interview. It was a guy who had bought all of Frank's Apple II discs. He had bought all of his Apple II equipment. He had basically invested and given Frank some money when he was very young to take all the Apple II stuff away and do what he wanted with it. And that guy was named Bootleg. Oh, Bootleg. So I'll tell you right away. I know Bootleg's real name. I'm not going to tell you it. There's some things that maybe I just shouldn't be a party to. And one of them is getting people too close to bootleg. But I am going to tell you the story of my time with bootleg. You know, the hacker myth has gone through a, a lot of different changes over the last 50 years. Everything from a self-aggrandizing term to a term of art to one used by industry or movies or writers by people trying to make things seem what they're not or to pass laws, or to make people stand up and give attention to something. Hacker can mean a whole bunch of things, and I don't think the debate is very worthwhile, certainly not worth the time to go into. 
But there are people who call themselves hackers, who are merely the flipping of bits and merely the changing of information from one region to another. And then there's people who call themselves hackers for whom life, life itself, is just one more barrier to break through, to get what you want, to have fun doing it, and to cause trouble all along the way. Bootleg was one of these people. He was an entrepreneur. The way that he first learned about Apple IIs was he was living in L.A. in the 1970s at a time when things were not so great, and he was buying really terrible slum homes, fixing them up enough to be livable, and then selling them. In other words, he was flipping. And this gave him a lot of time where he was sitting around these apartments not doing much. And he described it to me like somebody came up and offered him this, but it sounds like Bootleg had a couple of other businesses on the side. And in one of them, somebody offered to sell him an Apple II. And this person wasn't able to tell Bootleg much about where the Apple II had come from, but he was able to sell it to him for about $300. And this was at a time when it probably would have been closer to two or 3000 It was absolutely not where it was supposed to be. But it intrigued Bootleg, and he bought it, and so he would tinker with it. And he thought this was an absolute joy. He saw the future in it. He saw the fun in it. It was something that just made him happy at a time when he was rambling around doing all these other uh, let's call them gigs. Soon he figured out that it was easiest to get software by getting it from the local kids. So he would host parties for the neighborhood teens, set up a bunch of Apple IIs, and run copy parties. But he wouldn't just do that. He would actually dress as a pirate. Hand to heart, multiple people told me this. He would dress up with an eye patch and a fake parrot and a bandana, and he would greet people and run pirating parties dressed as a pirate. It was also around this time, in the early 1980s, that Bootleg put together an electronic magazine. Incredibly forward-thinking. You would buy it from ads in hacker zines and other locations, and it was a little bit expensive. It was a compilation of text files that he would fill up an Apple II disc with on both sides and then sell for a rather intense markup. And these magazines would have him writing in all uppercase, and he would have all the best text files compiled on this disc and always sign it the same way. Nuff said. Bootleg. Bootleg magazines are actually pretty hard to come across. I've put a bunch up on textfiles.com and Internet Archive as they've been found. Uh, not everybody could really afford these, so I'm not sure anybody ever had a full run of Bootlegger magazine, but it's out there, I hope, because it's an incredible insight into taking something as simple as text files and turning them into pure profit. Bootleg was always running schemes. In the early 1990s, when CD-ROMs were just on the rise and just folks could create them if they had the money, Bootleg did a very interesting thing. He figured out he could get all sorts of government information and then put it on a CD and then sell it for research purposes. It was something that actually really skirted the edge of the law. It was an incredible breach of privacy. But he was exploiting a loophole that governments were providing the information, but they weren't really tracking down what happened to the information after it was released. And because it was government information, it didn't have a copyright. So, technically, Bootleg was in the right, but also, technically, Bootleg was setting himself up. Over the years, he fell in with a, a number of groups that have some level of cachet of the time, the Legion of Doom, the Cult of the Dead Cow. 
He'd been to some DEF CONs. He got married in Las Vegas during one. So when I was going around at DEF CON and other gatherings talking about this documentary I was shooting, everybody told me bootleg was worth the trip. He lived in the northwest of Oregon, in a town whose name I'm just not going to give you. And he had had run-ins with the town at various points. He was a member of a biker gang called the Jokers. There are bike gangs named the Jokers throughout the country. His chapter was particularly unpleasant. No other way to put it. They'd had lots of run-ins with the law, and in the past few years, they've been utterly broken up. Their clubhouse was seized by the government and put up for sale. And the gang had been primarily broken up over the years for drugs. But what had finally broken the gang up was a murder of a ex-member. It's just not pretty. But 14 years ago, I wasn't aware really of all of that. I just knew I was dealing with somebody who was, quote, the real deal. His home was pleasant enough. Uh, had a beautiful bike out front. And when I went into his house, I noticed a number of monitors up, keeping close, closed circuit views of all parts of the house. And when I sat down for my interview with him, he asked me the one question that no other interviewee asked, which was, would I like some crank? I declined the crank, figuring it would affect my driving. And we conducted the interview going into a whole range of subjects involving Apple IIs, cracking, hacking, and what he believed ethically represented the, the fun, the, the ups and the downs of computers and the underground. At one point, we went outside and I did a little bit of an interview of him on his bike and he talked about what hacking was to him. It's what starts out the hacking episode of the BBS documentary. At one point, he took me downstairs in his house, and in the basement, he had piled up boxes in, in every direction. It was boxes on top of other boxes, some of them collapsing, some of them every which way. And he told me that somewhere down there was the Apple II software and Apple II equipment that he had bought from Frank Segler years and years earlier. I really wanted to go through it, but when I was on the BBS documentary schedule, I couldn't afford to spend days somewhere. I, I indicated I would come back at some point and that it was really important and that I hoped, really, that he would keep in contact with me. And I'm sad to say that day never came. Every once in a while, it's kind of occurred to me that maybe I should try to contact Bootleg, but looking through some of the records of the prison system and finding out how things have gone does not encourage me to get wrapped up in all that. It's not often I think this, but sometimes it's worth just letting things lie. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, thanks to Mark Pilgrim, Sam Johnston, Adam Green, James Bekoyanu, and the hundreds of other people on Patreon and elsewhere who have been helping me get out of debt.